that's right. That's right. You know, as a matter of fact, I have uh, somebody in my life that says, uh, you know, it's just it just seems so hard to be a Christian now. And I and I and I tell him, you know what? The opposite is true. It, it, it really is easier. I mean, you're going to have the same challenges that other people face, but the difference is you won't have to do it alone. That you that you'll have a guide, somebody to teach you the things that you need in life to help you get through the trials and struggles and challenges. And I mean, we're fortunate that we get, you know, I tell people, I had a friend a long time ago that used to tell me, oh, just put all your problems in a, in a, in a um, what do you call that, uh, paper bag and just throw it out the window. That's pretty much what we get to do on the Sabbath. We get to turn away from all our weekly toil and troubles and cares of the world, because I know I do. That's the day that the Sabbath is such a blessing, where I just get to forget about all those things and come and do something different, which is get a chance to come back because you know the Bible says that uh, remember the parable that Jesus tells about the sheep well as we go on through the week that's what tends to happen we can fall away but the beautiful thing is once a week God will bring us right back so think about people if they don't have that they tend to just wander 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 yes Uh, yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When we're so caught up in worldly things, it, it, it's excessive. It's over the top. I mean, everything. I mean, entertainment, or whatever it is that we we involve ourselves in. It, it's um, what's the word I'm looking for? It can be. Um, I'll come back to it. But uh, so when when we have all this stuff coming at us, yeah, the things that we look at here become boring. But you know what? God turns can turn it all around. And and the things you know, like Paul says. You know, so the things that might have been born before in the past, like, you know, sitting down and reading the Word, for example, now becomes exciting and beautiful. And the other things become not as, you know, when I hear people talking about Word, those things are just, they're boring. They're not interesting. They're meaningless, worthless. But when you study the Word of God, there's so much. There's so much that you can gain from it. Did you have, oh, got you. <laughs> yeah, so it, it can turn around. You know, I, I like doing studies with uh, different uh uh, uh, ministries, you know, and I'll just give you one quick example, just briefly, since we're on the topic, I think we have time. Um, so, in one of the ministries, the guy gives an illustration, he says, okay, so imagine over here, and it's true with everything, just watch how it works, because imagine over here is a buffet table, and it's full of all this beautiful color, and fruits, and vegetables, nuts, grains, and all the good stuff. <laughs> And so on the other table, you know, we have all the, the things that people just think, you know, the, the, the shrimps, the lobsters, the ice cream, the, all of these, you know, the, the hamburgers, the pizzas, and not, don't get me wrong, I'm not, I'm just merely making a point here. And he says, so here you have two buffet tables, right? Which one is the one that most of the, what the world sees as the one that's exciting and the one they want to feast off of? course this one because this one's boring right 
But the truth is, is one is going to give you life, right? And so eventually, they get turned around, okay? And so that's what God wants to do with us in all of this. It's true, you know, that God will turn it around. You know, just as Paul says, the things before and the things now. Uh, let me just finish reading this and we'll, we'll, we'll move forward. Um, the Sabbath fills that aching void, as I mentioned, recorrected with the Canada. The Sabbath is not a legalistic requirement or an, ex- or an exclusively Jewish institution. The Sabbath is a celebration of life that Christ has given us. It's a reminder to care for the environment around us that also is the object of our Creator's care. So we're going to look at a few other things that the Sabbath is really meant for. We're going to get to that just hopefully real quick. Just give me one second. Okay, so, um, so we, we've seen a little bit from what we've read that we are created in the image of God and what that image entails. Um, I'm going to read from the lesson study just a little bit here. It says, when we remember creation, we remember that we are created in God's image, something that is not said about anything else depicted in the creation account. It's obvious that as human beings, we are radically different from any other creature on the planet, regardless of how much DNA we share in common with some other animals. And contrary to popular mythology, we are not mere advanced apes or more highly evolved versions of some primal primate. As humans made in the image of God, we are unique among all that God has created in this world. So I like that. Um, So how does the creation story remind us of our relationship to creation? Would somebody take Genesis 2, 15 and 19 for me, if you don't mind? 2, 15 and then 2, 19. How about if we break that up if somebody takes one and somebody takes the other? So would somebody like to do 2.15? Go ahead, brother. Okay, so big responsibility, right? Taking care of everything that God had created for us, right? We are the caretakers of all things. When God says God gave dominion to Adam, that meant that he was to be the caregiver of all that God had created. Okay, somebody have 2.19? This is an interesting one because, you know, oftentimes people think that uh, God only formed Adam from the dust of the earth, that it was an intimate thing, which it was, and then he breathed into Adam, right? So he told us about that. But what does that first line say there? Somebody have it? Yes. Uh, Who wants to take it? Thank you, brother. So here we see that God created the animals from the dust too, right? And if you think about it, when when things die, where do they go? They go back into the ground, right? Animals and man alike. But here it's given, showing us that God had given Adam, uh, Adam a big responsibility. He named all the animals, right? So that should show us a little bit about how we're to have this special relationship with God's creation. Okay, so... Um, I'm just going to read the bottom and we'll move it to the next day's lesson. Realizing that God created our world reminds us of a responsibility to creation. We have dominion over creation. Having dominion does not mean exploiting. We are to rule as God's agents. We are to interact with the natural world as God would. Yes, sin has marred and messed up everything, but this earth is still God's creation and nothing gives us the right to exploit it, especially to to the detriment of other human beings, which is so often the case. And that's pretty sad. Not only do we destroy things of the earth, but we also destroy things personally with other people. You know? Okay, let's uh, let's go to Monday's lesson. Any comments? Any other comments so far? Okay, uh, celebrating freedom. Uh, so uh, we we saw uh, the creation. How the Sabbath points to that. Uh, talking about the second time that Moses. Uh, uh, mentions the the commandment. Um, This time the sentence introducing the reason for for keeping the Sabbath holy is not about creation, but rather a liberation from slavery and bondage. Deuteronomy 5, 12 through 15. Let me just read it just briefly. Um, You know what? I'm not going to read it all because we all know this is a a recap of the 
um, the, the fourth commandment, okay? But then, in Deuteronomy, he goes on to say, where he adds to it in verse 15, he says, And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord God brought you from there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. So what is what else did God do here? What else is he reminding him of? What did he do? First of all, he's reminding him, uh, you know, when we read before that, keep the Sabbath day holy, you know, you, you take a rest, your servants are to rest, and your animals are to rest. But here he's also saying that he liberated them, right? That he brought them freedom. And it's pointing to the Sabbath day, isn't it? So the Sabbath day also is a reminder of our freedom. Freedom from what? For them it was physical bondage and slavery, right? What does that point to for us? What does it mean for us? What are we going to be liberated from? What is the Sabbath trying to liberate us from? Sin, right? Bondage, sin, the same thing, right? Okay, so here we see that we got another reason as I mentioned, we're going to find different things according to the Sabbath. Um, so, although today we're not slaves in Egypt, we can all face another kind of slavery, one that in some ways can be just as oppressive. Does sin bring us down? Does sin keep us in bondage? Uh, you know, when we talk about addictions, that's bondage, right? Whether it's alcohol, gambling, sex addictions, uh, there's all types. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And uh, the other thing that the bondage it brings is it's guilt. You know, having to be carrying guilt around that because of what sin brings. But thanks be to our Lord and Savior that he wants to deliver us from that, right? Okay, what other forms of slavery do we face today? Oh, so let's take a look at some of them. Uh, Genesis 4, verse 7. Would somebody like to read that one? I'll go ahead and read it just briefly. It says, if you do well, you will not be accepted. And if you, oh, excuse me. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Um, I just want to say just briefly that, that this actually points to something even earlier. I don't mean to go off track. But uh, do you remember earlier in Genesis where God tells Adam and Eve, he tells her, he says, and your, and your husband shall rule over you. Remember that? After they sinned, after the fall? And then he comes and he says this, this is what it's pointing to. What happened in the fall, I don't mean to go off track, but what happened in the fall, see Adam and Eve were one unit. But when sin came in, guess what happened? She wanted to rule over him. And he wanted to rule over her. Okay? That's what this verse comes back to point out. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. Well, but this is why God tells us this, and this is why I brought that up, is because, you know, ultimately, yes, today, women don't want their husbands to rule or men to rule over them. I hear it all the time. That's right. And, and, but the thing is that man also wants to rule, you know. But so God had to be the one to decide. So he said, your husband is the head. He makes him the head as Christ is the head, you know. So he gives them both a role. But neither one of them does he say is going to rule over the other. He's saying that sin lies at your door and it wants to rule over you because of sin. And that's what brought that in. But anyway, so I didn't mean to go off track. I just wanted to point that verse out. Sure, brother. That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I'm glad you brought that word out. I should have highlighted that word, but you're absolutely right. Because this is what he's saying about the, the earth. Because this is what man does. The animals, we do it with the animals. 
you know, I was thinking about the poor animals not getting a break, you know, uh, with, with the cows, you know, cows were only meant to be milked, what, once a day, twice a day, I think. But now they're continually hooked up to milking machines almost 24 seven. That's why they feed them hormones so that they're able to produce more milk. And it's terrible. Talk about exploitation. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. Um, okay. So uh, let me just read another one. Uh, so uh, Hebrews 12, verse 1, Therefore we also, have, uh, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with the endurance the race set before us. So uh, again, here you see the, uh, the sin ensnaring. Second uh, Peter two nineteen says, "While they promised them liberty, they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by whom a person is overcome, by him also he is brought into bondage." So we talked about that a little bit more. So scriptures are giving us those examples um, of, of different types of sin. Uh, Sabbath is a celebration of freedom from all the things that keep us in bondage. On Sabbath, we are reminded there is freedom from sin. Now I'm so grateful for that. Not in our own power, but in the power of God, which is offered to us by faith. We are also reminded that it is freedom we did not earn. The firstborn Israelite children were saved by the blood of the lamb, smeared on the doorpost the evening before their exodus from Egypt. We too have been saved by the blood of the lamb and are now to walk in the freedom that is ours in Christ. Okay, uh, Romans uh, 6, 1 through 7. What is Paul saying here that can be linked to what we have been given in the Sabbath? So let's go to, and I'll say it again, it's uh, Romans 6, verses 1 through 7. And I'm going to read it just because it's a, a little bit longer. Uh, what shall, and I think most of us are familiar with this. Uh, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ, Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that Jesus as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father. Even so, we should also walk in the newness of life. So I'm going to bring out another point of what we're talking about here in just a moment. For if we've been united together in the likeness and death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that the old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. For he who has died has been freed from sin. So again, you know, we have that liberation of sin. You know, I want to just mention too that, so, did you know before we're baptized, we are spiritually dead? So if people are out there and they're not baptized, they're, why do I say that? Because it's a new creation. It's a spiritual birth. So if we're not reborn yet, then we're spiritually dead. Um, it's a recreation that God does. And by the way, that's another example of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is also God recreating us every week. It's a rebirth every week. Okay, isn't that Great to know. Interestingly enough, this recreation points to something else. Remember, he recreates everything, right? He's going to recreate the earth also one day, isn't he? So this is also what the Sabbath is pointing us to. We see the creation, but there's also a recreation. Um, okay, so uh, I'm just going to refer. Uh, so what is Paul saying here that can be linked to what we have been given in the Sabbath? So let's find out. In the very wrongdoing of Deut or excuse me, in the very wording of Deuteronomy 5:15, and remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out with a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. The people will remind it again that it was the work and power of God in their behalf that saved them. And I like that, you know, it's it's all God. It's God doing the recreating and all of this stuff. How much more should we as Christians realize that it's only the work and power of Christ in our behalf that has saved us from sin. 
This commandment tells us to rest in the salvation that God has earned for us by his mighty arm. We are set free from our attempt at righteousness as we remember that God is the creator and that we can trust him to recreate us too and to set us free, us even right now, from the bondage of sin if we are willing to let him work in us. Okay, so that's right. That's right. Yeah, a lot of people teach and have the belief, yes, you know, we are to, the scripture does say, you know, that, uh, that, um, uh, what, what am I looking for here? Let me back. What that? Right. Right. Yeah, a lot of people think that, you know, we're just supposed to let, sit back and let God do everything. No, you know, when you think of the yoke, that Christ tells us to put on. He's not saying, yeah, he does say that it's me that does it all, that, you know, in, in you, you have no power to do anything, really. So that's what he's saying, but yet at the same time, no, we're not just supposed to back. Is the Sabbath, and that's what we're going to look at as we go forward, is the Sabbath a day of just inactivity and relaxation? No, and that's what we're learning today. You're going to see that there's more to it, as we have already have. Um, okay, so let's go to Tuesdays, the stranger in your gate. And I, and I like this one also, you know. Uh, I always ask or, or encourage the class to, if you can't memorize all of the commandments, which I think we should, as, but as Adventists, we should memorize at least the fourth one, word for word. Why? Because we're Seventh-day Adventists. It's who we are. If we're going to preach the gospel uh, about the Sabbath, then we should know what exactly it entails, at least be able to, to say it and then to be able to teach it, hopefully. But, um, so, of course, the stranger in your gates, let's see what that entails. Exodus 19, verse 6. Would somebody take that, and if somebody would take 1 Peter 2, verse 9. So, Exodus 19, verse 6. And I think most of us are familiar with this verse. Okay, a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Um, and I, I would like to talk more on that, but for the sake of time, <laughs> we're just going to move on to the, the next verse, and we'll talk a little bit off it. Uh, so First Peter 2, verse 9. Somebody have that one? Amen. Okay, so the question is, what does this tell us about the status of ancient Israel? So the lesson tells us Israel had been called out of Egypt to be God's covenant people, the nation through whom, had they stayed faithful, the gospel would have been spread to the whole world. No question they were the object of God's special care and concern, given special privileges, and at the same time, given special responsibilities. So that's what it's showing us. You know, they were given a, a, a big responsibility. You know, they had the oracles of God. They were to be the ones proclaiming to the nations, the surrounding nations. That's why God chose them and put them in the middle of everything and everybody so that they could reach out to other people, right? But unfortunately, as time went on, we know what happened. They kept it to themselves. They perverted uh, the Sabbath, especially. And that's why Jesus came, because he had to come and set them right concerning that one commandment. And other things, of course, but it was mainly the commandment because of what they had done. They had put all these burdens on everybody. They had made their own rules with what they thought God was saying, which was totally uh, not what God was saying. And Jesus had to come and show them. And they still didn't understand. They thought, why is he doing these things on the Sabbath, you know, <laughs> of all days, right? Okay, um, Exodus 23, verse 12. What else is going on here? What does this teach us about how God viewed others besides the Israelites themselves. So 23 verse 12, let's take a look at that, see what it tells us. And if somebody likes to read it, feel free, and if not, I'll just read it.
and I like that, you know, refreshed, right? Um, we need a time of rest, you know, we, from, all, from all the cares, the struggles, the worries. Again, you know, people carry those burdens seven days a week. They never get a rest. You think that's detrimental to their health? Their spirit? Their physical? Their, their emotional? And, you know, all of it, right? And people get physically sick from these things. We need a break. God knows what we need. Um, okay, so um, let's see what their lesson tells us, and we'll move on to, to Wednesdays, or we'll talk about it. Uh, so it says that uh, the universality of the Sabbath is something that many people miss. Of course, the most common error is that it was only for the Jews. And I just want to share this briefly with you. So if anybody ever tells you that the Sabbath was for the Jews. Well, of course, you know, when we see it, as I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, Ezekiel 20, 20 says, uh, Moreover, I gave them my Sabbath as a sign between me and them that they would know that I'm the Lord who sanctifies them. Uh, if, if I'm not getting it backwards, uh, Exodus, uh, uh, is it Exodus 30? Um, anyway, uh, God says that it's, a, uh, tells them that it's a sign between the children of Israel and him. So people say, see, it's the Israelites. And everywhere they go, it's the Israelites. See? Okay. Well, here's the catch. Uh, if we were to go to Galatians 3.29, if somebody wants to look at it, feel free to mention it. But uh, it says that if we are in Christ, I said it earlier, right? If we are in Christ, then we are Abraham's seed. Right? And we are heirs to the covenant promise. So what does that mean? That I'm a Jew spiritually because I'm adopted. I'm drafted into the lineage of Abraham, the father of the Jews. So there you have it. Okay, so it is for the Jews. Well, guess what? I'm a Jew spiritually, so it's for me, right? Okay. So though we should always keep in mind what the Sabbath represent, uh, represents to us, we should remember too that of what it should tell us about others as well. In a sense, our, our resting and relating to our Creator and Redeemer will drive us automatically to look at others with new eyes, to see them as beings created by the same God as we were, loved by the same God who loves us and who died for them as well as for us. Uh, as we have seen, Exodus 20, verse 10, Deuteronomy 5:14. I'm going to read 20:10. It says, But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. Now I just want to comment that when it says stranger within your gates, when it mentions stranger there, what it was talking about in those times was foreigners. So these were most likely not Jews. So God is saying that even these people that are non-Jews that are in your gates, you know, and I, and I come across that all the time, people that are staying with me or, or family that's around me, you know, that want to work or something. I say, no, as long as you're around me, I don't, I, I don't try to push stuff. I just tell them, no, I'd rather you not. Uh, I don't want you doing anything on that day. You know, take a break. And if I have somebody working for me, I do the same thing. I tell them, no, take a break today. I don't want you to do that for me. But uh, the best way is by example, you know, people will look and they'll see, people ask me, they call me all the time, are you still keeping that, that, that day, that Sabbath day? <laughs> and I say, yes, I have, brother. Uh, the Bible says that it's a perpetual, you know what perpetual means? Perpetual actually means um, never ending or changing, never ending or changing. So God said it's perpetual. It means it's not ever going to end. It's not ever going to change. But people keep going back to that. So there's another verse you can give them where the Bible says perpetual. Take them to that and ask them what perpetual means. And then have them say that the Sabbath is null and void. Because that would be contrary to what the Bible is saying. Okay, so give me a second here because I lose my pace. That's right. That's right.
Absolutely. Yeah, well, the problem is, unfortunately, they don't get all the information and knowledge and get the ability, or have the ability to really study in depth the things that they need to know in order for their, their hearts to be changed and have the understanding that God wants them to have. Um, but yeah, you mentioned something I was going to say. Uh, oh, what was it? It'll come back to me. Okay, but thank you for your comment. Definitely. Good comment. Um, okay. So, uh, we were on Wednesdays here, right? Where was I reading from? Okay. I lost my spot. We were on Tuesday's lesson. Okay. No, I don't think we're at, at Wednesdays yet. Were we? Monday, Tuesday. Sorry, I apologize. Um, no, we weren't on Wednesdays yet. We're still in. Yeah, I mentioned it. Yes. Um, okay. So let me read uh, the rest of this uh, about the strangers. Uh, that even the strangers within the gates, that even though those not yet partaken of the covenantal promises given to Israel, that even they should enjoy the Sabbath rest, says a lot. Human beings, even animals, should never be exploited, abused, says the word of uh, exploited or taken advantage of. Every week the Hebrew people and we too should be reminded in a powerful way of just how much in common we have with other people. And even if we do not enjoy the blessings and privileges that others don't, or excuse me, even if we do enjoy, we must remember that we are still all part of the same human family and thus we are to treat others with respect and dignity. So yeah, again, you know, I don't try to force the, God doesn't force anything on anybody. All we can do the best way is by example. People know me, they know, you know, and they wonder. And at times they'll come up and ask me. And that's a good thing because then I get the opportunity to try and bring them. By the way, were there any Jews in Genesis 2 when God made the Sabbath? No, there was no Jews. So the Sabbath was not just for the Jews. Uh, how could your own Sabbath keeping perhaps become a blessing to those who don't keep the Sabbath? That is, how can you use the Sabbath as a witness to others? That was the comment on the bottom. Yeah. Yeah, and, and again, we're going to see, hopefully we can get to Thursdays, because Thursdays is really good. I'm going to try to go quick here. Yeah, well, continually, God mentioned that over and over. Yeah. Do you know why the, the orphans and the widows? They, they were helpless. Yeah, uh, women were not allowed to work. Women could not support themselves. That's why they had to have a man or be married, because otherwise they'd be destitute. And, of course, we know orphans would be the same, same thing. So that was the first bell, right? Okay, we're going to try to get through this. Uh, as I mentioned, I, I wanted to get to... To Thursdays. Um, yeah, so uh, let me just comment and then we're just going to do Thursdays. Does anybody have a problem with that? Okay. So I just want to comment that uh, the Sabbath is not just a day of worship, but to bless others, as you mentioned. We are to bless others. What did Jesus do on the Sabbath more than he did on any other day? He healed. On the Sabbath, it was about people and caring for their needs, right? Of course, he got a lot of flack over it because they didn't understand that that was a day that it was supposed to be about other people and not a day of, of putting burdens on people. Um, so let's go to, let me just read the bottom of that, okay? It says, pursuing our pleasure. Okay, let, let me just look at a verse because this really helps a lot. Uh, we're looking at Isaiah, and this is on Wednesday still, Isaiah um, 58 particularly starting at verse 13. And we're all, from, most of us are familiar with this, I would hope. It says, If you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your own pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, let me just back up and just comment on that, turn your foot away. It's kind of interesting. It's like, well, what does that mean, turn your foot away from the Sabbath? 
Well, from the studies I've looked at, uh, turning your foot away really emphasized traveling on the Sabbath. What do we do with our feet? Well, they would travel. That's how they got everywhere, right? So the foot. We're, we should not be traveling on the Sabbath. Remember, Jesus said, he said, pray that your flight not be on the Sabbath, right? So the importance of it. Okay, so turn your foot and call the Sabbath to the light. The holy day of the Lord honorable. So first of all, Sabbath needs to be a delight for us. Amen. Because like we mentioned earlier, it's a burden for people. And shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own word. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord and will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So if you need to know some of the things that you shouldn't be doing on the Sabbath or that you should be doing on the Sabbath, go to Isaiah because he clearly it makes it very clear. You know, even speaking our own words. We're to put everything that we do during the week aside. Not, well, not everything, but all of the, the worldly, uh, you know, uh, dealing with our struggles and toils and, what, you know, with work and whatnot, all of those things, speaking our own words, our own pleasures, it should be all about the Lord. It should be all about preaching the gospel. It should be out reaching others. And it doesn't mean that you have to go out all the time. You know, we have enough work to do in our own home to people to preach, right? To bring them to the Lord. Okay. Yes, sir, brother. Okay. Say, say that again. As human beings, unholy. Absolutely. Yes. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. That's right. That's right. Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. And, and yes, and by the way, I always tell people, does the Sabbath make us holy? Yeah. The Sabbath, the Bible tells us, is a way of sanctifying us. Well, I mean, how so? Well, look at where we're at. We're studying, we're learning, we're growing. That's sanctification, right? So the Sabbath, the Bible says, does make us holy. Unfortunately, that was the second bell. Uh, let me just see, since uh, we're not filled up yet, I can probably mention a couple of the comments if somebody else wants to make a comment. Uh, and Thursday's lesson says, what is the Sabbath a sign, a sign of? Uh, Exodus 31, 13, uh, it mentions them all. Uh, ways we can apply this and and what is said here to ourselves today, people who believe in the perpetuity of God's law. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, I'm going to just read uh, Exodus 31, 13. Speak also to the children of Israel, saying, Surely my Sabbath shall you keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you. There you have it. It just said the Sabbath sanctifies us, right? Um, Exodus 31, 16 and 17. I'll just read it just briefly. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. See why people say it's only for the Israelites? Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. I'm going to leave it right there at that. So yes, it is an ongoing forever. And we know that we'll be keeping the Sabbath in heaven forever also, right? Okay, so I'm going to end it on that note. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. We just ask that what we've learned today that we will be able to retain the information. May your spirit rest upon us and remain on us. Father, I pray throughout the rest of this Sabbath uh, um, coming together, Father, and fellowship. And uh, I just pray that uh, whatever we've learned today that we might go back and study.